So, uh, so I'm Bill Gerling, glad uh, you didn't hear me introduce myself before because I'm about to do it again. Uh, I am a principal architect here at Rubrik. I've been on board for uh, approaching four years now. And I have worked uh, in and out of uh, sales engineering, product, and now I do this uh, new product incubation role, heavily focused on uh, cloud native protection, SaaS protection, things like that. Yep. Yep. Uh, I'm Bill Sidekick, not an official title. Senior developer advocate at Gubik. Also been at Gubik for almost four years now. So, um, and a lot of the stuff that I do is, um, well, the developer advocacy and working on our integrations and anything that touches the API, really. Cool, let's dig right in. Um, so I'm gonna start out with some just general, you know, AWS adoption themes, some, some things that are, you know, drivers to our customers either utilizing AWS or adopting specific architectures, and then we're gonna parlay into where we play in the space, what we do, how we do it, why we do it that way. Uh, we'll have a demo at the end so you can see uh, some of the solution, and then there should be plenty of time for, for Q&A. So please uh, have some questions ready at the end if, if anything is of interest to you. And so we'll start out with uh, you know, why AWS, and this is, this is super high level stuff that is probably common knowledge here in the room, but I always do like to level set as to sort of why we're in the space and why the space looks like it does. Uh, so first and foremost, obviously ease of use. Uh, the, if you think about what it, what it took in the past to provision infrastructure and deploy applications compared to what you can do on AWS, it's, it's almost mind blowing, right? I mean, there used to be, You'd, you'd plan an application deployment, you'd have to procure hardware, you'd have to rack it, stack it, make sure you had power, make sure you had cooling, um, you know, get the OS installed, get all the middleware installed, and then you can finally begin deploying your application. And now with, uh, with AWS, you've got the ability to rapidly deploy infrastructure if you want, or forego infrastructure entirely, use platform services, use higher level services, and you know, bring applications to market in days instead of months and years. Uh, flexibility, so flexibility sort of geographically in deployment, right? You can go global in minutes, as they say, but also flexibility in consumption model, own as much or as little of the stack as you'd like, whatever makes sense for your business case. Reliability, um, so you, you think about a service like S3, 11 nines, uh, it's really hard to reproduce sort of the economies of scale and the resiliency of the platform unless you operate at the scale that Amazon operates at and with the experience that they operate with. And scale becoming another thing, especially economies of scale, which will sort of parlay into cost, but the, the ability to, to sort of leverage uh, that scale regardless of, of what scale you're operating at. Performance, uh, basically pick your performance for, for most of the services, right? You can, you can save money and, and be less performant, or you can spend extra money and be as performant as you'd like within your budget. Security, so especially security of the platform um, handled by the best in the business, in my opinion. Uh, if, if you're gonna adopt a security posture similar to Amazon, you're gonna be making significant investments in sort of lower layers of the stack in order to achieve it, or you can just consume as a service and gain those benefits. And then cost, um, so cost, especially if you're well-architected, which we'll talk about a little bit, very easy to consume in a utility model, pay only for what you use when you use it. If you have bursty workloads, you can accommodate them. Cost will burst and then simmer back down as the application simmers down. All of these things are sort of the goal of the goals of consuming cloud, right? The business benefits at a high level that, that we seek to achieve by consuming cloud. And cloud is obviously a shared responsibility. Again, probably more things that most of y'all are familiar with. Cloud provider responsible for sort of the security availability of the cloud and consumer responsible for security and availability of the components that they're managing. Always the data, often um, applications and sometimes middleware and platforms deployed on infrastructure. And what we see in the space is folks adopting well-architected architectures because Amazon is doing these well-architected reviews. They are encouraging folks to adopt postures that are segmented at the account boundary. Uh, you know, from an ops perspective, each one of these accounts is a management point. You can roll it up through tooling and organizations and whatnot but you have to plan for and configure all of this. And then uh, in accordance with well-architected framework, you're also going to be multi-region more likely than not, each of those being a point of management as well. And the vast majority of folks have some existing on-premises footprint, some stuff in SaaS, 
And so all of this from a data management and data protection perspective can at times become cumbersome because there's a sprawl in tooling, there is a sprawl in consumption models, and there's these hybrid and, and sort of SaaS-based architectures that don't necessarily fit the Amazon model. And so that's kind of what we find our customers trying to solve for is I'm in AWS at scale or I'm accelerating my adoption of AWS is the most, most common scenario. And I'm still trying to maintain and account for these other ancillary components of my environment that in a perfect world will likely also be in AWS one day. And this, is, this can be particularly problematic when you see a lot of lifting and shifting, which is often the fastest way to achieve a cloud-first mentality, uh, not the best way, as we all know. And so a lot of folks are in this situation where they've lifted and shifted a bunch of workloads into these types of architectures, but they still kind of have to care and feed for them as monoliths as opposed to um, caring and feeding for them as cloud-native applications. And so when, when we talk to customers that uh, are accelerating their adoption of AWS, these are the things that are most often top of mind. And uh, I think it's all predicated on, on the top right card. I think it's top right everywhere. Yes, it is. Um, and, uh, and, and really, you know, this, the ransomware activity of the space is ballooning. I mean, I don't need to beat this point into the ground because it's obvious. And as a byproduct of that concern, all of these other concerns sort of manifest, right? So if I have a lack of visibility and I don't know what data sets are protected and how, that is increasing my risk in the unlikely event that I get struck with, uh, with one of these bad actors. And similarly, you know, can I restore quickly? Do I actually know that? That becomes incredibly relevant when you're planning for these types of events. And so that's kind of what, uh, what we're trying to solve for in the space is customers that are coming to us with this accelerated adoption of AWS and really trying to figure out how they get a good baseline backup, how they know that their mission critical workloads are protected, they know that they're recoverable, and they know that when they go to recover them, it's actually sort of a, a tangible, pragmatic thing that they can achieve. And so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background on Rubrik, who we are, where we came from, where we play in the space. Um, if you think back to our inception, which, uh, you know, six, seven years ago, I believe my timelines are bad. Uh, we grew up protecting enterprise applications and uh, infrastructure inside of the data center and then aging these data sets out to S3. Like that, if you think about V1 of our product, that was the whiz bang thing, was like instant recovery for VMs and the ability to lifecycle these data sets into S3 for long term retention. Why? Well, because of the aforementioned things that we seek to achieve with cloud, right? The resiliency of S3 as a service, the cost efficiency of it for data storage, the fact that it's air-gapped away from these things that we're protecting in the data center are particularly advantageous. And the way that we did that is we built this policy engine that you can feed sort of desired state into from a data protection perspective, and then you assign that out at various echelons to your workloads in the stack, uh, you know, auto discovery, auto inheritance, and then the policy dictates the desired protection level, the software helps you achieve that protection. And the, the, the best parallel that I could, could draw as a cloud person is if you think about a tool like Terraform from HashiCorp, you feed them a template, that template gives you desired state for the infrastructure you want provisioned, and then the platform with its plugins will handle all of the iterative steps that need to take place in order to achieve that desired state. That's what we're doing with data protection. You build a policy, we schedule the jobs, we do retries, we do data lifecycle. If we can't achieve the policy that's been assigned to the workload, then we alert, you're out of compliance, you intervene, you remediate. Um, we also have, have predicated ourselves you know, widely on offering of rapid recovery, and fundamentally, that started out as instant recoveries for VMs and for databases. And we'll sort of describe how that parlays into um, the cloud native for AWS story here in a moment. Uh, API first platform, so we've always had uh, a RESTful API of some sort. Um, start out with open API, we do a uh, graph uh, on the platform that does cloud native protection. And uh, security kind of at the heart of everything that we do. And I mean, this goes way back to the old days. There's, there's great sort of stories that we share uh, in the conference rooms and stuff about pig-headed engineers that force features into the V1 of our product that are now paying dividends today. But at the time, it was like, why is this guy so insistent on this thing? Um, 
And so that's a, that's a fun little anecdote that really, I, I mean, from day one, Security has been front of mind in how each of our platforms is architected, and now it is, it is the focal point of our business, obviously. Um, extension to cloud, I mentioned you know, the ability to archive into S3 as, as sort of an, an initial cornerstone feature of what we were doing in the space, but it actually um, does begin to go quite a bit further than that, and we'll, we'll touch on that here in a moment. Um, but outside of sort of this bridge to cloud, this, this easy button you know, archive to cloud workflow that was in the V1, We've iterated on that, and then we've iterated sort of on data management as a whole. So really everything that we've talked to up to this point has kind of been data protection. And what we've brought to bear of late is the ability to take those data protection workflows, assets, and metadata, and to run intelligence on top of it in order to extrapolate insights or run automated workflows that provide increased business value. And so if you think about uh, from a cyber resilience perspective, look, peeking into these data sets, looking at things like change rates and file sizes and extensions and whatever, and then using AI and ML to do pattern analysis and alert based upon um, some sort of boundary that has been breached and some sort of you know, mass change event. Uh, so this is a workflow that will allow you to get an alert when we think uh, something has been encrypted by a malicious actor of some sort, and then we'll walk you through what's been affected, when it was affected, uh, and what you need to do to recover rapidly. Similarly, we've got some data governance workflows that we can run on these data sets. Uh, so this is sort of like defining rules and boundaries uh, that certain types of data can live in, and then we will, we will introspect the data set, and then we will give you an alert if some sort of sensitive data appears to have spilled over some boundary. And so these are just value-add workflows that you can run on top of what used to be sort of just modern data protection to really turn this whole thing into a suite ready to address and remediate uh, some sort of malicious act in the environment. From a cloud integration perspective, uh, I mentioned we started with the archival workflow to S3, right? So this is a policy-driven lifecycle of recovery points into S3. And uh, this has matured in a litany of ways that we don't have time to discuss today, but it's always sort of been incremental, index, searchable, and rapidly recoverable. Now we've got all sorts of cool workflows that we can run in order to introduce additional data efficiencies. Uh, we've got mechanisms by which to tier data sets to cheaper classes of storage in the event that, uh, that it's aged to a certain point. Uh, we've got the ability to swing these, these locations you know, around to, uh, to different deployments of our software and use them for recovery in the event that, um, that the original source deployment was unavailable. And then you can piggyback on that archival workflow a uh, few versions of our software back at this point. We brought the ability, if you're protecting virtual machines, to basically do a manage lift and shift of your most recent recovery point into EC2. And you can run this workflow as part of uh, the SLA, essentially. So each time we back a VM up, we'll auto-convert it and leave an image behind that you can launch. Or you can run this on demand uh, and you sort of do an on-demand convert, at which point you get a, a fully ready-to-rock instance on the back end. And so these are the bridge to cloud features uh, that I mentioned that, that, that are sort of part of protecting data center workloads and then using the cloud as, uh, as a as a storage target, resilient, you know, a scalable storage target, as well as using it as uh, perhaps a target for test dev workflow, or as target of a migration effort, or some sort of DR workflow. And really, the next logical step was protecting these cloud workloads and doing so in a way that is commensurate with everything that we had built leading into it, which is this zero trust architecture with a focus on ransomware resiliency and rapid recovery. And so uh, what we're going to talk about today, and Yop's about to hop up here after this, uh, this slide, is we're going to talk about cloud native protection. We're going to talk about uh, you know, sort of how it's automated, so both from a discovery and protection perspective, but also from a granular restore perspective. Uh, that includes things like file level recovery, uh, cross-region and cross-account replication for resiliency against uh, ransomware, as well as this unified experience that you get uh, across sort of hybrid and multi-cloud boundaries. And so with that, uh, Yap, I'll let you take it away. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Bill. Cool, so uh, getting started uh, with Rubik, uh, 
deployment is very simple because we are an API first platform, so we can utilize the fact that we have our own APIs and it makes it easier to communicate directly with AWS and to integrate in there. So the deployment is a very simple, uh, very simple process. Um, but getting started with the deployment, going further, uh, you want to start actually protecting workloads. Uh, our approach there is to uh, work with SOAs that can be assigned on different, uh, on different levels of uh, granularity and also uh, amount of objects. And what those SOAs do is they will, uh, they will take care of uh, the scheduling and the execution of, uh, of all the uh, backup uh, tasks that need, to, uh, uh, that need to occur. And we're using our, uh, our, our policy engine, uh, which, take, uh, which takes care of this, uh, of this entire process. So you can see it up there. Um, and using that, uh, we, can, uh, we can have near zero uh, RTO uh, with just two clicks. So you, we use the Rubik, uh, the Rubik interface to initiate this, and we can or take care of the entire uh, orchestrated workflow here. So if a workload uh, drops out, it's gone, and we can then immediately, immediately restore it from, uh, from another account. And we'll also, uh, we'll also showcase this and other things in the demo, because it's, of course, very easy to show this, uh, to show this on the slide, but uh, we'll actually see this in action as well uh, later on. So. Uh, what it would look like if you uh, if you want to recover, we can uh, we can use uh, an API call. Uh, we create uh, we create the volume endpoint. Uh, we attach the Kubernetes uh, pod to this, which uh, starts indexing. The metadata is going to be sent back uh, to Rubik, and of course, everything that is uh, transmitted is going to be encrypted. Uh, both at rest and when, uh, in trans uh, when in transmission. And it's important to note that it's only metadata that's going to be uh, uh, sent off, so we don't have your data. And once we get to the point of recovery, uh, it can be on either a file level or folder level or wh whichever items need to be recovered, only those items will be recovered, so that will uh, that will also limit the amount of data flowing and also the cost associated with, uh, with the recovery. And getting into data, data sovereignty and the defense against ransomware, which is a very, uh, very hot topic uh, at the moment. So if you have an organization, uh, an account within an organization, you can uh, replicate it uh, either within the same org, but you can also replicate it over to uh, another organization. So you have another level of uh, segmentation to keep your uh, to keep your data secure and uh, always available. And then we have the operational side of things. So uh, thinking about uh, reporting, for example. Uh, we have uh, multiple dashboards available that will, uh, that will show what the status of your, uh, your backups and recoveries are, and it gives you an easy overview of uh, what, what, is, uh, what is going well and where action might be, uh, might be required. And then because of our uh, API approach, we can, uh, we can also use Terraform for, uh, for configuration tasks and for deployment tasks, so we can see it on the screen here. So we want to apply a configuration. Uh, our Terraform provider will translate this over to the different API requests, and those API requests get sent over. Uh, the resources are created within AWS. And then if we want to get rid of those resources, then we can just use Terraform apply, uh, uh, Terraform destroy, and all the resources will be uh, uh, decommissioned. And with that, we got to the demo. Which button is it to start it? Cool. So here we can see it in action. 
bit. I don't know, it's quite it's very hard to see. Come on over. There you go. Thank you. All right, y'all, let's take a quick look at cloud native protection for AWS. Uh, we're going to cover sort of day-to-day uh, -day care and feeding, right? Uh, linking accounts, building policies, signing out those policies, running some recovery workflows, and then we'll cover some of the ops stuff as well. So uh, looking at the event stream reports, uh, RBAC, things of that nature. Without further ado, let's just uh, dive right in. We're looking at the inventory view here, and this is sort of your heads up display of all of the workloads that uh, our SaaS platform is aware of and currently uh, managing. This is a sort of a unified experience here. So you get both your data center workloads, your cloud workloads, your SaaS workloads, all included in this inventory view. And were it not already populated with uh, AWS workloads, you'd be hinted to link in your accounts and, and begin protecting resources right away. Since we've already got some added, I'm gonna come over here to cloud settings and I'm just gonna show you a quick example of how we might protect some AWS workloads by linking in an account. You can see here that we've got a few different accounts linked in. Some are in a good connected status. Some need a permissions upgrade that we can uh, automatically run through by means of updating the uh, CloudFormation stack that uh, underpins our role and role policy. Some of them are in a half connected state. It's a lab. Uh, but basically the workflow is as follows. You, uh, you come here, you click add cloud account and you drive through this wizard select the services that you'd like to protect. And then here you just type in the account number of the account that you wanna link in and give it a friendly name. That'll be displayed in our UI. After you hit next, you'll be handed off to uh, the CloudFormation console and you'll have a template preloaded up that's ready to build out the role, role policy and custom resource that we need in order to link the account in and begin interacting with it on the APIs. Uh, you can also do this programmatically through our SDKs, uh, through things like our Terraform provider, and that'll allow you to do this on mass without the need for sort of this wizard based approach if you've got many accounts. Once you've linked in the account, uh, these inventory cards will populate here. You can drill down into whatever service you want to interact with, take a look at the accounts view. And um, from the accounts view, we can actually protect sort of globally. So if I come here and I grab all of the accounts in scope right now, I can actually uh, choose to assign an SLA domain out to them directly at the account level. And what an SLA domain is, is it's a protection policy, right? It determines RPO, it determines data lifecycle. I'll actually walk you through building one here shortly. But important to note is that when you assign it at the account boundary, it gives you the ability to auto protect all resources provisioned in that account that don't have a more explicit assignment already. And we'll do some more explicit assignment workflows here shortly. Uh, if none of these policies match what you'd like to assign out, you, you can build one interactively. And basically all you need to do is come down here, select the services that you'd like to protect, and then give it a friendly name. We'll just call it reInvent 2021. And then you just define RPO. So maybe I take a daily for 14 days. I'll take a monthly for a year. I'll take a yearly. We'll keep that for seven years. And then we're going to define data lifecycle. One element of data lifecycle here is tiering down to lower cost, you know, S3, S3i, et cetera, storage after some threshold has been met. And so maybe here um, after 14 days or actually after 16 days, let's uh, tier down to, uh, to a storage target that we've already got pre-built. That's all that it takes. You'll maintain the bulk of your recovery points in S3 you'll have a near line rapid recover cache uh, stored as EBS snaps that you can use for recovery. We can also replicate. Um, so you can enable replication either to uh, the same region or to some other region. Uh, we can also go cross account. So here as an example, I'm just gonna pick some region as a target and I'm gonna set some threshold. Let's say we wanna keep all seven years in both regions. Uh, it'll, uh, it'll increase your cost but you'll have you know, redundant copies of all of these recovery points uh, in both locations. And really more likely than not, since, since you're predominantly uh, worried about the nearline recovery points, a more realistic scenario might be keeping you know, those 16 days worth of recovery points in the target region as well. And that's it. Uh, on the RDS side of the house, we have the option to specify the auto backup window for uh, RDS, which sort of allows us to inherit the point in time recovery capabilities for the auto backups. We also do our own on-demand snapshots for long-term retention. So you get married up the point in time recovery in this auto backup window, as well as the long-term retention recovery capabilities of the on-demand snaps. I'll show you that uh, in, in the demo a little bit later on. Once you've defined all the parameters, uh, confirm the name, give it a description if you like, and your policy 
can be created. I'm not going to create one right now, and I'm not going to assign one to all these accounts either. But what I am going to do is take you through some of the other assignment boundaries that we can use. So we can create tag rules. Tag rules are pretty slick because they will allow you to select a service. And then you can come in here. You can specify a name for the tag rule. So we'll just say reinvent 2021. And then you can specify uh, a tag key and value to match on. You can pick one if you like. So here uh, we've got one that pre-exists. Maybe if the owner is Ed in you know, one or more accounts, you can also select all accounts. Then whenever we discover an instance that matches those parameters, pick an SLA domain, map that SLA domain to the corresponding instance. And this will actually override the account-based assignment. So that gets you the ability to sort of use the account level assignment as a catch-all, use the tag rules as the bulk of your assignments. And then we can come in here into the EC2 instances view, and we can actually interact directly with uh, the various objects in, in scope and assign policies to them as well. So uh, if I look for my favorite instance right here, and he or she is very special, I can manage protection at the instance level, pick a policy, assign that policy out. And so this will override both the tag rule assignment and the account level assignment, thus giving this instance sort of an exception-based unique policy. Don't want to do this too much. We don't like unicorns, uh, but sometimes we have to do it, and so we have this option. Drilling down into the instance, you can see that uh, the policy is assigned. We've got a bunch of recovery points here. For any day where a recovery point is available, I can jump into it, and I can execute a recovery workflow. There's a few different things that we can do. Um, so I'll just walk you through each of the options. We can restore files. This will allow me to step through, search the file system of, uh, or browse the file system of, of this snapshot, and then pick and choose individual files and folders that I might want to restore. We can also restore in place. So uh, this will roll the existing instance back to the selected point in time. You'll keep your instance ID, your private IP, all that stuff. And, uh, and simply, it's basically a reboot of the instance with new disks, right? Uh, we can also roll the tags back as part of this workflow. We, we can then also do an export, which is a whole new instance from the recovery point. And what this will allow us to do is resize the instance, launch it in a different account, launch it in a different region, re-encrypt the volumes, um, so on and so forth. And so this is, this is great for copies across accounts or across regions, uh, for testing restores, things of that nature. So you've got granular rapid recovery here. If you are replicating and you need to use a replica to restore for some reason, uh, we'll do that automatically in the restore workflow. You can pick the original, the replica, or the archive uh, from the export dialog box and select that as your source of truth when you're when you're exporting as well. So simple but powerful powerful workflows here. On the RDS side of the house, it's uh, it's actually very similar. Let me jump one level up here, and. Uh, you essentially get the same hierarchy of assignments, but uh, instead of just the file level restore and uh, sort of snapshot based export, you also get the ability to come in here and run these point in time recovery workflows out of the auto backup window. This uh, utilizes sort of this slider based approach to bring you to a specific point in time and then use the log backup to uh, restore an instance from, from that point in time. Great uh, user experience here, and also sort of homogenized with what we do for SQL Server running in a traditional VM or Oracle running in a traditional VM or in an instance in EC2. So if you've got DBAs that are familiar with our capabilities in sort of the, the traditional database uh, inside of a, of a managed OS experience, then this experience on RDS will be very familiar to them, very comfortable for them. And so that kind of recover or covers the recovery workflows at a really high level. Other things that I like to, to touch on outside of the EC2 file level recovery in place restore and export and this RDS restore workflow is the fact that we unify your events view here across uh, sort of all of the platforms that we protect. So you can see here that the, you know, we're, we're protecting workloads on premises, we're protecting workloads in the cloud, we're protecting SaaS workloads. This event stream gives you visibility to all the tasks and activities on the platform. Uh, this audit log gives you the ability to interact with uh, with audit logs from the Polaris platform. So when you look at the event stream is what is our platform doing? Uh, how is it interacting with other resources? This audit log is, you know, how are, how are entities interacting with our platform? Who's doing what on our platform? And both this audit log and these events, uh, you can sort of 
export out through the API or what have you. Um, we can also syslog relay it, uh, and you can pipe this into you know log manager or sim of your choice. So a lot of folks like to centralize these types of activities and things like CloudWatch logs or what have you. Uh, reporting is unified as well. So across all uh, workload types, across all accounts, uh, you get these unified compliance reports. If you run one, it will you know, allow you to sort of time bound it and it will allow you to pick and choose which workloads and whatnot are in scope for reporting. You can schedule them to run. Uh, you can run them on demand, download them as CSV, PDF, uh, send them out periodically in an email. And uh, then you can also grab this data uh, through the API also, and then visualize it through you know tooling of your choice as well. So if you wanted to like put this in QuickSight and use that for your visualizations, then you could definitely do that. Last thing that I like to touch on is uh, role-based access control. Uh, we have granular RBAC and federated identities in this platform. Pull your identities in from whatever source you choose, and then you can build out these custom roles that will allow you to sort of delegate access to different segments of your environment uh, from a centralized location here. So here, if I just jump into AWS Native, you can see that I can sort of get very prescriptive about which uh, sorts of accounts and uh, environments this role is allowed to interact with. I can get prescriptive about not only which accounts are they allowed to interact with, but what are they allowed to protect account-wise? What are they allowed to restore to account-wise? And then more holistically, just what privileges do they have in general? Maybe they're read only, or maybe they have a subset of the protection and recovery permissions globally. Maybe they are sort of a power user, but they can't add data sources. You can certainly dictate all of those things here, as well as dictate which SLA domains they can interact with and utilize. And that can be particularly helpful if you want to create some role where maybe they can protect resources, but they can't unprotect them by using these do not protect or clear assignment uh, classifications. So granular RBAC, definitely important when you're centralizing a bunch of stuff, especially from these disparate environments. Uh, we offer up the ability to be really, really prescriptive about who can do what in, uh, in which segments of your environment in our data manager. And that really covers it. I do appreciate y'all uh, taking the time to come out and, uh, and check out the demo. If you've got uh, questions about things that you've seen here, want to go a little bit deeper, uh, we'll be happy to take them. Thanks much and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. All right, y'all, let's take a, nope, let's not. <laughs> Sorry for the recorded demo, but uh, I did lose confidence in the Wi-Fi and I figured we would go with the sure thing. Uh, so today we talked about how uh, Rubrik can sort of centralize data management for your multi-account, thank you, and uh, in hybrid architectures. Uh, we talked about how we could do that without the need for persistent long-running infrastructure in your AWS environments. Uh, we talked about how we offer up rapid recovery, so you know, cross-account, cross-region recoveries, image-level recoveries in place, as well as granular recoveries, so file-level restores kind of at your leisure, either on demand or pre-indexed. Uh, talked about the air gapping with the cross-account and cross-org replication, and we talked about how we're an API-first platform with things like the Terraform provider often up uh, integrations with common tooling in the market. Uh, one thing we did not talk about is the fact that we've got world-class support, and uh, we put our money where our mouth is. Uh, when we POC, we encourage our customers to open tickets with our support organization. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before, but uh, we, like to, we like to have our prospects and our customers interact with the support team. Uh, net promoter score off the charts, uh, always a good experience. I love those folks. I work with them every day. So please, uh, if you're ever testing anything that we have to offer, feel free. And with that, uh, probably open it up for Q&A. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, I think that there is no microphone, but you can shout at me. If you don't want to shout at me, uh, just don't ask the question right now. We'll be over here, and you can just come talk to me afterwards. Uh, um, yeah, and if you would like to see the demos in action, we're also on the expo floor, and our engineers will be happy to, uh, to give a demo that's not pre-recorded, so you can actually see it in action. <laughs> that one was only pre-recorded by about 20 minutes, for the record. Thank you very much for coming out and uh, listening to me pontificate about cloud native protection for AWS. Love talking about the cloud. Please do fill out your surveys and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.